In this episode of Above and Beyond, we take to the skies with the scientists who first realized all wasn't well with our fragile blue planet and proved that ozone, vital to Earth's survival, was disappearing at an alarming rate. We return to mission STS-97 and experience a tension-filled docking procedure deep in space as Endeavour and her five-man crew link up with the International Space Station. We check out an unusual gizmo called a spherical trainer that's designed to disorientate and confuse astronauts' visual senses on Earth in order to reprogram their brains for the weightless conditions in space. The ability to detect even the smallest crack or defect in the shuttle's components is crucial. To that end, we examine the progress being made in micro-sensor technology, both for space travel and in countless applications closer to home. We look at Navajo women and their contribution to NASA. It wasn't until the 1960s when Apollo missions were bound for the moon that we were first able to see complete pictures of the Earth. Environmentalists began to look at our planet as a single fragile ecosystem. Now we are intensely studying the thin halo of atmosphere that surrounds and protects the Earth, recycles the air that we breathe, regulates climate and acts as a protective barrier, filtering out much of the sun's harmful radiation. Several years ago, an international group of scientists proved that ozone, a key element in this filtering process, was being lost at an alarming rate over the South Pole. In fact, a sizable hole develops over this area each winter. Without ozone, the sun's harmful radiation could destroy life on Earth. A group of man-made compounds called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, used as refrigerants, cleaning solvents, and some plastic foams were to blame for this environmental disaster. They eventually made their way into the atmosphere and began to destroy the ozone that surrounds the globe. Using the beautiful seaport town of Stavanger, Norway as a base of operations, an international team of scientists was assembled in an emergency effort to make a detailed study of the North Pole. Most of the work was performed aboard two NASA aircraft. This is the ER-2. For the mission, special wing pods were attached containing atmospheric chemistry analysis equipment and a host of other instruments. Flights were made about 12 miles up along the fringes of space and right into the layers of atmosphere directly affected by ozone loss. The ER-2's research partner was a modified DC-8. It flew at lower altitudes but had increased fuel reserves which allowed it to cover more territory, even flying directly over the North Pole. Inside the DC-8, there was a complete scientific observatory loaded with sensing instruments. Scientists performed their experiments and were able to map results right on the spot. This instrument contains four lasers capable of shooting light many miles up into the atmosphere. The light reflects back to the plane and provides scientists with a cross-sectional map of ozone concentrations as well as aerosols or regions where ozone depletion is capable of occurring. Initial results from both aircraft indicated that high concentrations of CFCs had been found at northern latitudes, primed for ozone destruction. When combined with high altitude ice clouds, the right amount of sunlight and confined, slow moving masses of air, ozone destruction occurs. As a result of this airborne mission, the scientists were able to confirm the process and predict areas of depletion. International policymakers have since met in the hopes of limiting the amount of CFC production and agreed to phase out its use completely. Many scientists are still concerned that it wasn't done soon enough. Researching safe, economic replacements for CFCs is a vital part of solving this serious environmental issue. Thanks to the intensive work done in the last few years, 
We know why ozone depletion exists. It's now up to the international community to take responsibility for the future of our global environment. In the last edition, we witnessed the spectacular launch of the space shuttle Endeavour as she embarked on mission STS-97. We went on board the space vehicle to join the five-man crew led by Commander Brent Jett. And we'll continue that journey this week as Endeavour heads into space to rendezvous with the International Space Station orbiting high above the Earth. Day two of the mission for Commander Jett's crew, pilot Mike Bloomfield, mission specialist Joe Tanner, co-mission specialist Carlos Noriega and Mark Garneau, a representative from the Canadian Space Agency. It's their first full day in space this time around. The astronauts are scheduled to fire the space shuttle's large orbital maneuvering thrusters twice today as they make their way toward the International Space Station, where three fellow space travelers await their arrival. Currently flying approximately 8,000 statute miles behind and below the ISS, Endeavour's crew will spend much of today preparing for the eventual docking with the station. Here on the lower deck, Joe Tanner joins Carlos Noriega to prepare the airlock for a check of the spacesuits they'll wear during three scheduled spacewalks. Mark Garneau and Mike Bloomfield begin checking out the systems they'll use to deliver the station's first set of solar arrays to the International Space Station. These will be the first of eight sets of solar arrays that at the completion of the space station construction in 2006, the airlock for a check of the spacesuits they'll wear during three scheduled spacewalks. Mark Garneau and Mike Bloomfield begin checking out the systems they'll use to deliver the station's first set of solar arrays to the International Space Station. These will be the first of eight sets of solar arrays that at the completion of the space station construction in 2006 will comprise the station's electrical power system converting sunlight to electricity. The solar arrays are mounted on a blanket and can be folded like an accordion for delivery. Once in orbit, astronauts will deploy the blankets to their full size. Gono and Bloomfield check out the shuttle's robotic arm and space vision system to ensure they're working properly and also inspect the spacesuits and tools that Tanner and Noriega will use over the course of the spacewalks. Whilst Tanner and Noriega continue to check out their suits in the airlock, Brent Jett and Mike Bloomfield successfully execute two rendezvous burns to bring Endeavour into the proper alignment with the ISS and close the gap between the two spacecraft, still half a world away from each other. And at the end of day two, the astronauts are happy that mission STS-97 is going to plan. Day three is docking day for the crew of Endeavour. At this stage, the shuttle is about 700 miles away from the link-up with the International Space Station. Commander Brent Jett and pilot Mike Bloomfield begin the final stage of rendezvous activities by setting up the aft flight deck controls. On the International Space Station, Expedition 1 Commander Bill Shepard, pilot Yuri Gidzenko and flight engineer Sergei Krikalov will monitor Endeavour's approach and docking, communicating with the shuttle using air-to-air -air radio signals. Endeavour will approach the station from below to line up with the Earth-facing docking to avoid disturbing the station and its solar arrays with thruster jet debris. Firing of a maneuvering jet is scheduled for 10 a.m. with the shuttle's rendezvous radar system beginning to provide supplemental navigation information about 10.50 a.m. The final burn, called the terminal initiation or T-burn, will, will occur at 11.33. When Endeavour is about 2,000 feet away, almost directly below and behind the International Space Station, Jet takes manual control of the approach. With the help of crew members operating computer tracking programs and handheld laser distance measuring devices, the mission commander guides the shuttle to a point about 500 feet below the station. 
At this point, he rotates Endeavour 180 degrees into a tail forward attitude for the final approach in Dokken. Jet pauses Endeavour's approach at a distance of 30 feet before moving in for Dokken. Ever so slowly, the two spacecraft inch towards each other. Solar arrays on the modules of the ISS or T-Burn will occur at 11.33. When Endeavour is about 2,000 feet away, almost directly below and behind the International Space Station, JET takes manual control of the approach. With the help of crew members operating computer tracking programs and handheld laser distance measuring devices, the mission commander guides the shuttle to a point about 500 feet below the station. At this point, he rotates Endeavour 180 degrees into a tail forward attitude for the final approach in Dokken. Jet pauses Endeavour's approach at a distance of 30 feet before moving into the Dokken. Ever so slowly, the two spacecraft inch towards each other. Solar arrays on the modules of the ISS are repositioned by flight controllers in about one hour after docking, Mark Garneau uses the shuttle's robot arm to lift the P-6 solar array out of its payload bay moorings and park it above the bay so that its temperature can begin equalizing with that of the station. Garneau tilted the truss structure 30 degrees to the cargo bay, where it will remain. Mark Garneau and Mike Bloomfield begin checking out the systems they'll use to deliver the station's first set the airlock for a check of the spacesuits they'll wear during three scheduled spacewalks. Mark Garneau and Mike Bloomfield begin checking out the systems they'll use to deliver the station's first set of solar arrays to the International Space Station. These will be the first of eight sets of solar arrays that at the completion of the space station construction in 2006 will comprise the station's electrical power system converting sunlight to electricity. The solar arrays are mounted on a blanket that can be folded like an accordion for delivery. Once in orbit, astronauts will deploy the blankets to their full size. Gono and Bloomfield check out the shuttle's robotic arm and space vision system to ensure they're working properly and also inspect the spacesuits and tools that Tanner and Noriega will use over the course of the spacewalks. day for the crew of Endeavour. At this stage, the shuttle is about 700 miles away from the link-up with the International Space Station. Commander Brent Jett and pilot Mike Bloomfield begin the final stage of rendezvous activities by setting up the aft flight deck controls. On the International Space Station, expedition the airlock for a check of the spacesuits they'll wear during three scheduled spacewalks. Mark Garneau and Mike Bloomfield begin checking out the systems they'll use to deliver the station's first set of solar arrays to the International Space Station. These will be the first of eight sets of solar arrays that at the completion of the space station construction in 2006 will comprise the station's electrical power system converting to the airlock for a check of the spacesuits they'll wear during three scheduled spacewalks. 
acceleration and intense pull of gravity during ascent is tremendous. But when the main engines cut off and the shuttle reaches low Earth orbit, the crew enters a totally new environment. Everything floats. There's no up or down. For 70% of first-time space travelers, the initial couple of days in orbit means they will feel ill. Microgravity disturbs the workings of the inner ear, much the way car or air travel can affect people on Earth. Responding to this need, scientists have been developing a pre-flight adaptation trainer for astronauts to use before they fly. The Neurosciences Laboratory in NASA's Johnson Space Center is responsible for studying the human body's condition in space. Understanding gait, posture and other adaptable functions helps scientists stay in touch with human space travel needs. Shuttle missions typically last up to 10 days, but future space station visits and long-range lunar or Martian outposts will mean months or even years of continuous space travel. This spherical trainer is used to emulate similar sensory conditions to those experienced during spaceflight. Large overhead projectors display a montage of computer-generated patterns that fill the subject's field of view. It's the movement of these patterns that eventually fools the subject into thinking that he or she is moving, not the visual. Two-way communication allows them to describe their experience and for the doctor to request different head movements. Once exposed to a variety of pre-programmed visual cues, the brain recalibrates itself to accept what is similar to a weightless environment. The human body is essentially plastic, meaning that it's capable of conforming to any environment, even space. When members of the Skylab 4 crew returned to Earth after nearly three months in orbit, their first steps were tenuous. They did readapt, but it took time. Today, many astronauts coming back from space undergo evaluations so that researchers can better understand this process. In the next decade, this research will be critical in better preparing astronauts for a long-term commitment to space. Being able to determine the condition of components like the shuttle's main engines is critical. And that's the primary goal for this NASA-sponsored research effort at the University of Cincinnati. A team of faculty members and graduate students is developing a series of microsensors to indicate the health of spacefaring vehicles. Almost everything visible here is just packaging used in testing. The sensor itself is just a tiny speck in the center. Viewing one of these sensors under a microscope reveals their sophistication. Advanced micro-machine techniques make it possible to include valves, heaters, or even motors in a device with a diameter less than that of a human hair. The goal is to embed these tiny flow sensors into the walls of critical shuttle engines and system components to ensure they're functioning properly. The sensors are so small that even if one came loose, it would have a negligible impact on engine performance. Researchers are also working on vibration and crack detection sensors for other parts of the shuttle, which could point out existing defects or indicate fatigue in high-stress areas where problems might occur. There are a number of potential spin-off applications for microsensors like these. Researchers at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center are already exploring their use in the care of premature infants. A significant number of premies suffer respiratory disorder and many must be connected to a ventilator around the clock. But setting the ventilator remains a relatively imprecise science. And improper oxygen levels can contribute to more severe problems, including damage to the brain. The medical researchers are studying the possibility of putting a micro sensor inside the plastic tube inserted in a baby's trachea. Advanced micro sensors, enhancing the health of spacefaring vehicles and those who may one day fly them.
This is Navajo land, 25,000 miles of seemingly endless geologic art, encompassing parts of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. It's a nation within a nation steeped in beauty and tradition. But more and more, the face of the Navajo landscape is changing. New development is being encouraged on the reservation, an area rich in natural and human resources. Many of the Hogans that still dot the reservation were at one time the primary form of housing. Today, it's in these Hogans that the tribal tradition of rug weaving is practiced and passed on from generation to generation. Using the dexterity developed through years of honing this craft, a group of women working in a Navajo collective are sewing the blue jumpsuits worn by NASA astronauts. Each suit requires 150 separate sewing functions and nearly all meets NASA's rigorous acceptance standards. It's a long way from the Navajo reservation to the shuttle simulators and training aircraft at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston but it's the contrast that makes this relationship so intriguing. For the Navajos, the work marks another step on the road to economic self-sufficiency. Sewing the astronaut suits, using old world skills in a modern day epic of astronomical proportions. That brings us to the end of this edition. Join us next time and let us take you once more above and beyond.